Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Stephen's United Church of Christ in Harrisonburg, Virginia. My name is Craig Jamie, the pastor here at St. Stephen's. Thank you for worshiping with us online today. This morning, we are celebrating the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. My sermon comes from the beloved book of Romans, chapter 8, entitled, Listen to the Groans. Friends, let's prepare our hearts for worship with a word of prayer. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our needs before we ask. Have compassion on our weakness and mercy on our feelings of unworthiness. Teach us how to be compassionate and merciful followers of Jesus Christ, through whom we pray in step with your Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We will read verses 12 through 27. Hear these words from Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 27. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, but most importantly, to the doing of God's written words. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for our children's time. All right, friends, you know what to do. It's your turn to hold the phone or the tablet, adjust the computer, or sit a little closer to the television, as long as the adults let you. Good morning, boys and girls. Have you ever had a belly ache? Maybe you ate too much food and your stomach started hurting, or maybe you got a stomach bug and felt badly. Well, sometimes my belly hurts when I'm worried or nervous. Does that ever happen to you? Can I tell you something silly? When I was a boy, any time I had a stomach ache, I would always do the same thing. I would get on my bed, sit on my knees, grab my pillow, put it against my lap or against my stomach, and then I would face plant on the bed. Then I would groan out loud because my belly hurt. Eventually I would fall asleep and my stomach would settle. My parents would come to check on me and quietly laugh because I was asleep on my knees with my rump in the air, my backside in the air. They didn't laugh because their son was sick. They laughed because one of the first pictures taken of me as a baby was me sleeping in an incubator, which is a cozy, warm room for tiny babies. I was sleeping on my knees with my backside in the air. I was a premature baby, so the doctors and nurses had to take special care of me before mom and dad could take me home from the hospital. I weighed only four pounds and four ounces. Can you believe that? Do you like 
to groan when you have a bellyache? Do you ever groan when you're bored out of your gourd when nobody will play with you? Uh, let's have a contest. On the count of three, children, I want to hear your best groan. One, two, three. Uh, good groanings. All right. I'm going to give the adults a chance to play our game. On the count of three, I want to hear your worst or your best groan. One, two, three. <laughs> Great. Sounds like y'all have been practicing. <laughs> oh, goodness. Does groaning feel good sometimes? Uh, when you're feeling bad, sometimes it's just good to uh, groan. Well, thanks for participating in our groaning contest. It was truly uh, dreadful. In today's passage, the Apostle Paul writes about three groanings. Did you catch the three things that groan in the Bible? Creation, humans, you and me, and the Holy Spirit. This morning, I want you and I to specifically look at the groaning of creation. Creation groans waiting for the children of God to be revealed so that creation will be set free from its bondage to decay. The scriptures say that creation is groaning like a mother in labor. As the child gets closer and closer to being born, the mom really suffers. Sometimes they have heartburn. Often they can't sleep or get comfortable at all. And I've heard a lot of mothers say, I'm about to bust. It's hard to carry a child, and I have no idea what that's like. I've only observed. There's a joy in a mother's heart and in a mother's eyes after she gives birth to her child. It's like for a moment, all of her suffering is replaced by an indescribable love. Like an earthly mother, our mother earth is waiting for God's children to be born, for God's dream to come true, for God's people to care for the world that God so loves. We are connected to mother earth. And we are called to tend and to take care, to be good stewards, and to leave the earth better and more beautiful than we found it. And I'm afraid we've not done a great job caring for God's creation that God loves. If you've ever seen the Lion King movie, maybe you remember when Scar, Simba's evil uncle, killed Mufasa, Simba's dad, and Scar's brother. After Mufasa's death, Scar took over as the pride leader of the Pride Lands. Do you remember what happened to that home? It was in bad shape. The hyenas took over, drove the animals out of the ecosystem. The earth was abused and Scar did not care. The sun never seemed to shine with a smile. The rivers dried. The vegetation died. There were no flowers blooming. And the lions that remained there were crestfallen. They were sad. But once Simba finally returned to take back his rightful place as king of the jungle, he restored order to creation and the dark clouds that covered the Pride Lands were lifted. It rained. The exiled animals came home. The river flowed again. The plants grew. The flowers blossomed. And the animals sang and danced with joy. That is what God wants for God's world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I used to sing a song in church called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Maybe you've heard it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I know what the songwriter was trying to say. But the fact is, when you turn your eyes to God's world, the things of this world grow strangely clear in the light of Jesus. The world's beauty and pain can be seen more clearly. Its laughter, its cries, we can hear them more deeply. We can see God wrapping God's loving arms around all that God created. Hans Kung once wrote that God's kingdom is when creation is healed. This week, I want you to listen for the groans. I want you to hear the belly aching of the earth. And you can do so if you listen close. It's God asking you to care for the world in which we live. I think you can do that. Let's pray together by repeating our prayer out loud. Our God, 
Thank you for earth and for my place here. You love us and everything and everyone in it. Help me love the world like you. Help me listen for groans. Take care of me, my family, my friends, and my church. Amen. Thank you for being such good listeners today. If you ever need someone to listen to you, you can always speak to me, even if it's just to say, hello. <laughs> okay, I'm going to speak to the adults now about the other two groans, and you're welcome to listen. If you have any questions about what I've said or what you hear or read, don't be afraid to ask because we learn by asking questions. You got it. Five years ago, everyone who answered the question, where do you see yourself in five years, was wrong. <laughs> the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, was close. In his 2015 TED Talk, Gates warned that we were not ready for the next pandemic outbreak. No one predicted the disaster that our 2020 reality is, except Peter Turchin. He's a scientist specializing in cultural evolution and mathematical modeling. On February 3rd, 2010, he published his theory in the scientific journal Nature entitled, Political Instability May Be a Contributor in the Coming Decade. After analyzing declining wages, wealth inequality, and other social pressures, he predicted that 2020 would be mayhem. Seven years ago, he repeated his calculation in an Eon essay entitled, Return of the Oppressed. Professor Turchin casually wrote, the future looks like a rough ride. Yeah, I'd say so. In a recent interview for Time magazine, Turchin said, and I quote, as a scientist, I feel vindicated, but on the other hand, as an American, I have to live through these tough times, close quote. Unfortunately, he also warned that the worst may be yet to come. As societal crises like this typically last anywhere from 5 to 15 years, the Apostle Paul is right, you know. Not only does creation groan, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly. Even amid the turmoil we've faced this year, we've experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit of Pentecost working in our lives. We know the delight of being called God's beloved children. We feel the freedom that our sins have been forgiven, that we have been justified in, by faith in Christ and saved by God's grace. Even regathering in our beautiful sanctuary in masks and sitting six feet apart from others, we still feel joy being together with our siblings in the faith. We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Yet our human experience is a commingling of joy and sadness, of gratitude and grief, of thanksgiving and overthinking. We groan. Gordon Cosby said it best. Each person sits next to their own pool of tears. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 56, 8. You, O Lord, keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. How comforting to know that God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, tracks collects, and records your pains. Even though you feel alone, you're never alone. When you weep, Jesus weeps too. He also asks pertinent questions, especially to Mary on Easter Sunday when she couldn't find his body. He asked, why are you crying? If your best friends are betrayal and abandonment, Jesus prayed your prayer. My God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Are you accompanied by anger all the time? Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers in the temple and he crapped, cracked the whip, driving them out. God is with you and invites you to examine your pain, name your sorrow, and vocalize your tears. You know your pool of tears. Share them with God who sees you and listens to you. I'm reminded of the biblical Psalms with phrases like, I cried out to the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. How long, O Lord, how long? Trevor Hudson writes, befriending our tears like this connects us deeply with God, opens our hearts to healing grace, and enables us to be more present to the tears of others. 
If you scroll through social media lately, you've probably felt the weight or seen the groaning phenomenon on display. Among the occasional pictures of friends and family and flowers, I see a wide range of raw emotions in my feeds. The feelings folks feel are published. People are using social media to project their anxieties and their griefs in public posts. This epiphany has helped me recalibrate my relationship with the platforms. The result has led me to be less critical and more curious upon what these cries for help or attention are founded. Sometimes listening to the groans looks like reading the comments. Before social media was so prevalent, I would look for and listen to the groans differently. I remember riding along with the police chief for Chowan University, whose public safety career was impressive, but whose disposition for the job was even more so. He took the campus ministry team in his cruiser around town. The purpose for our field trip was to see the places in our community that groaned the most and the loudest. We went to a trailer park, the same one in which he was raised. He knew the residents and they waved to him as he passed. We drove across town and pulled into a dilapidated town park. Stories about the powers and the principalities at work in local politics gave us a unique perspective. You'd be amazed at how fast a job stops a bullet, he said, as we rode over a bridge into the county limits and turned underneath it. The police car weaved between trees on a gravel dirt road. A homemade sign on one of the trees read, Gun Checkpoint. Chief Burke said, if you get here, they want to make sure you have a firearm. I think he was joking, but I didn't ask him to clarify. We saw the sight where the last homicide took place. The owner hadn't bothered to clean up the former crime scene. Huh. Finally, we drove to a local public school. It was summer, so the groans were inarticulate, but the stories of parents and children, of teachers and a rolling cast of administrators helped us hear what we came to hear. That year, we dedicated our time to address the groans of our community. We partnered with the town church leaders, organizers, and athletes to refresh and rededicate the city park. We worked hard to show up and our ministry of presence helped us facilitate a touch the truck event for the local school and get families on campus for a hosted athletic event. We had a lot of fun listening and responding to the groans. In fact, our ride along gave birth to an annual campus wide ministry service event. It's still going on 15 years strong. What began as a listening session became an adoption of our community. What is true of nature is true of us. Creation groans to be set free from its bondage to decay. We groan while we wait adoption. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul introduces us to the metaphor of Christians being adopted into the family of God. Anyone who's fostered a child or adopted a child knows the rigors of the adoption process. In the Greco-Roman culture, the process of adoption was difficult in a different way. Fathers held patria potestas, the legal authority over their family. If a father was alive, he was in complete control. Being adopted into another family meant that a child had to pass from one father to another father in a two-step process. The first step was a symbolic sale carried out three times. Twice a father would symbolically sell his child and buy them back. But the third time he would not, and the patria potestas was broken. The second step in Greco-Roman adoption required the adopting father to present a legal case for the child's transfer before a magistrate and seven witnesses. After the ceremony, a civil trial were completed, the paternal power was legally transferred and the child was officially adopted. For Paul, this process of adoption was important, but the consequences of adoption were paramount. Adopted children lost their rights and standing in their old family, but they became true heirs to their new father's estate and could not be denied rights. By law, the adopted child's old life was wiped clean. All debts that remained were canceled, and they were a new person with a new life in which their past no longer held influence over their future. The apostle revisits this adoption analogy to give us hope. 
When our adoption as God's children is finalized, our bodies will not deteriorate, nor will they be instruments of sin. We will be born again and enjoy the inheritance of our God, free from the control of sin, free from the burden of debt, and free to be a child of the living God. We groan now because we know our hope and we wait for it with patience. Get this, God also groans. The sound of God groaning is the Spirit interceding for us, praying for us according to God's will. In our weakness, when we don't know what or how to pray, when you and I come to the end of our words, when we are speechless and at a loss for what to say or pray, the Spirit of God lifts us up in prayer. As I was preparing for ministry, I took a summer internship at a church just a few blocks from my house. The church was searching for a new pastor, and the interim decided I should learn the ropes of visitation from him. Dr. Ray Allen took me to the hospital with him once a month to visit at church members for a few hours before lunch and a few hours after lunch. He let me debrief our visits during our meal and prepared us for our rounds afterward. I noticed that he always sat down close to the bed, that he always held their hand or touched their leg or their shoulder, and that he always prayed for them before he left. I don't think I would have picked up this pattern except we visited a woman who was comatose. He sat down close to her, held her hand, recited a passage from scripture from memory. He sang a few lines from an old hymn and he prayed for her. As we were walking out the room, Dr. Allen stopped, put his arm around my shoulder and turned us around. We walked back into the room and he asked me to render pastoral care to her copied his routine, but changed the scripture, song, and prayer. When I said amen, he said, good job, and we came home. For whatever reason, we are sometimes aloof in prayer, yet the Spirit eludes us in prayer. God's groaning for us is a constant prayer, for God's dream to be realized, for God's will to be done, for God's heaven to come to earth, for God's complete, total, and ultimate eternal healing of our groaning world. If you listen closely, you will hear God's Spirit praying for you today. What groan has your name on it? Let us pray. Groaning God, you are speaking to us through the pangs of creation and in the middle of the pains we carry. You are praying for us with sighs too deep for words. You love us and you have adopted us into your family forever. Transform these groans into the glory that awaits, for we have tasted and seen the first fruits of your indwelling Holy Spirit. As your Spirit brings us to where the pain is, guide us with grace to respond in surprising and creative ways to repair the world you love and made. In your mercy, hear the prayers of your people for all who struggle with mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual stresses. And thank you for turning us to friends in our time of need. We pray for those who wrestle with addictions and praise you for every moment of sobriety and time spent well with family and friends. We pray for those whose anxiety and grief overwhelms them. And thank you for the ones dedicated to the work of helping and healing. We pray for those who are unwell and praise you for the constant love and support that you provide for us through our families, our friends, our caregivers, our allies, our champions, and our church. Be near us, we pray, as your people. Help us to receive your many gifts with gratitude and faithful stewardship. Help us to work hard for equality, peace, and justice for all. And sometimes, Lord, help us get into good trouble. Hear us now as we offer our deepest needs, our pressing burdens, and our hopes and fears to you in silent prayer. O Lord, attend to these prayers according to your will, letting all creation see your glory and recognize your Son, the crucified and risen Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. I really hope you and your loved ones are well and healthy. I also hope you have a great week this week. If our church can help you, please let us know. Before we close with a benediction, I'd like to invite you to join us online next week for worship. When you decide for, to worship with us in our sanctuary, we'll do our part to keep our worship space clean and safe and ask that you wear a mask, maintain six feet of social distance, and sanitize your hands often. Now receive this benediction as we close our time together. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.